In this video, we're going to learn about some of the reactions of hydrocarbons. So we'll learn about the reactions that alkanes can undergo, and then we'll look at all the different reactions that alkenes and alkynes can undergo. They will be reactive in different ways. Both, all three types of molecules would be un, able to undergo combustion reactions, but alkanes will undergo substitution reactions and alkenes and alkynes will undergo addition reactions instead. Some of the images and examples that are used in this video have been adapted from Cognity Higher Level Chemistry, the textbook that we use in class. So alkanes are not very reactive, but they can undergo substitution reactions in the presence of heat or UV light. You can't break the single bonds between the carbons but you can substitute a halogen for a hydrogen. We're going to look at the mechanism of that in the next, um, in the next slide and part of the video. So, but this is the general equation. So we have ethane, ethane reacting with bromine in the presence of UV. It will substitute, it can substitute one bromine or two, um, depending on the reaction. And so we end up with bromoethane and then hydrogen bromide as a side product. So now we'll talk in detail about the reaction details that happen. So the first step is the initiation step. So UV light will break apart the halogen. In this example, it's chlorine making a free radical. So UV light splits apart a chlorine molecule and you have two chloride radicals. Then there's the propagation reaction. So those chloride radicals, because they're free radicals, they'll cause chain reactions of bumping into a molecule, creating a stable chloride compound, but then ripping apart that other molecule and turning it into a free radical. And then it will that free radical will bump into something else, creating a free radical, and it'll just go on and on. So in this example, we have methane bumping into one of those chloride radicals, and then you get a methyl radical and hydrogen chloride. And then the methyl radical will react with a chlorine atom molecule and create methyl chloride and a chloride radical. This will go on and on. In fact, it's said that you could break apart a thousand chloride molecules with one UV ray, with one photon, because it would go on and on and on bumping in to one another. Then finally you get to the termination step. So you, a few things can happen. Two chloride radicals can bump into each other to make chlorine again. Two methyl radicals could bump into each other and create ethane. Or a methyl radical and a chloride radical can interact and form methyl chloride, which is the substitution reaction that we were talking about. So if you need to name an organic halide, which is what these products are, so this example, you consider the halogen atom as just a branch on the parent chain. So you would name it like you would name a branch, but you would shorten the name of the halogen to fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iodo. So in this example, it's chlorine that's attached. So this would be chloromethane. Now, if there was a longer molecule like butane and you had, say, a fluorine attached to the carbon 2, you would say it's 2-fluorobutane. Two two so remember, you name the positions of those additions to the chain. So if we were asked to draw some examples, the first one, if we were asked to draw 1,2-dibromoethane, we would do the same thing we would do with a regular alkane, but we would add in the, the groups. So if we had ethane, so we have two carbons, like so, and it says that on carbon one, there's a bromo, and on carbon two, there's a bromo, and then we just fill in the rest. So it would look like that. The other one, we're saying 1-bromo-2-chloropropane, so we'll draw the parent chain, the three carbons, 
And on carbon 1, there's a bromo. On carbon 2, there's a chloro. And then the rest are hydrogens. Like so. So the properties of organic halides are that they're more polar than regular hydrocarbons because of the presence of the halogen. That means that they don't have, you know, symmetry as much now because there's that, you know, extra molecule or extra atom. And those atoms would be more electronegative than a hydrogen bonded to the carbon. So those bonds would be more polar, making the molecule more polar. This means that they have increased intermolecular forces and higher boiling points than hydrocarbons. And they're more soluble than hydrocarbons of similar size. So all hydrocarbons can undergo combustion reactions and they can undergo either complete combustion or incomplete combustion. In complete combustion, there's enough oxygen present. So all of the hydrocarbon will react to form carbon dioxide and water as the products. But if you don't have enough oxygen, you will not get just carbon dioxide and water. You will also get carbon in the form of soot and carbon monoxide as byproducts as well. So that is a problem because carbon monoxide is highly toxic. It competitively binds for oxygen on your red blood cells and you can actually suffocate if you're in the presence of carbon monoxide. Because it's odorless and tasteless, you don't even know what's happening. You just get very sleepy. So here's an example of the complete combustion of propane, so C3H8. This is what we would burn in our barbecues. Some people use it as a heating source in their homes. if They're not connected to the natural gas pipeline. So C3H8 plus five oxygens, so sufficient oxygen for each propane molecule, will produce three carbon dioxide and four water. If you have incomplete combustion, you have propane, but maybe only two oxygens for each propane molecule, so it's limited. It's a limiting reactant. So you'll end up with carbon dioxide, some carbon monoxide, some carbon, and then the four water. So incomplete combustion, you do not get as much um, carbon dioxide. You end up with byproducts as well. So alkenes and alkynes can undergo addition reactions where the double or the triple bond is broken and something is added across the double bond where those free electrons are. They're now freed up to bind with something else. So in hydrogenation, gaseous hydrogen is added across the double bond at high temperature and pressure in the presence of a nickel or platinum catalyst. So in our example here, we have ethene reacting with hydrogen gas with the presence of nickel and 180 degrees Celsius, and we end up with ethane. So we add hydrogen across the double bond. So we break that bond, free up two electrons that can then bind with the electrons in the two hydrogen atoms available. So during hydration, you're adding water across the double bond, and this is done by reacting an alkene with steam in the presence of a strong acid like sulfuric or phosphoric acid, and this produces an alcohol. So if we look at this example, we have ethene again, but this time the other reaction is water, and we end up with H3PO4 interacting and it's happening with a high temperature because you're reacting with steam and that's where the water is coming from and you end up with ethanol right there during halogenation halogens or hydrogen halides will react with alkenes at room temperature to make halogen alkanes and the reacting halogen will lose its color during the process of the reaction so in this example we have ethene again, 
and it's reacting with bromine, which normally has a brown color. But as it's reacting and forming the halogen alkane, so the 1, 2 dibromoethane, the brown color is lost and it turns to colorless. So Markovnikov's rule says that when a hydrogen halide or water is added to an alkene or an alkyne, the hydrogen atom bonds to the carbon atom within the double bond that already has more hydrogen atoms. So if it's in the middle of the molecule, it won't matter because they both have the same. But we use the principle, the rich get richer. So if we looked at this example, we have one propene, and we're going to interact that with hydrogen bromine. So in this example, this carbon has more hydrogens than this one. So when the double bond breaks, we're going to add the hydrogen to this one and the bromine to this one. So it's going to look like this. So it's going to be CH3, and then we can put the Br and an H, and then CH3. So this fits Markovnikov's rule. So now we're going to talk about addition polymers. So alkene monomers, which are small repeating subunits, so this would be an example, ethene can be combined to form polymers or long molecules of repeating subunits. So under the right conditions, we can combine these in a polymerization reaction to form the polymer, which is polyethene, right there. So the general formula for this reaction would be this, N-propene, so a, whatever number of propane molecules. The polarization reaction happens, and then you end with polypropene. And this table demonstrates some of the polymers and their trade names. So polyethene or polyethylene or polythene or PE, the monomer is ethene. It's a tough, durable polymer plastic. We use it in plastic bags, bowls, bottles, and packaging. Polypropene or polypropylene is made from propene. It's also tough and durable. We use this more in crates and boxes and plastic rope. This one is Teflon polytetrafluoroethene. Um, it's a good non-stick surface so it can withstand high temperatures too. So non-stick frying pans and non-stick taps and joints would be examples. And then polyphenylethene is polystyrene. We know it as um, insulation, packaging, and so on. Because it it's light, but it's a poor conductor of heat. So that means that you can pour a hot beverage into a styrofoam cup and you're not going to burn your hand. The heat's not going to transfer through.